For those who don't know me, I'm Patrick Griffiths. I'm with the European Space Agency in the EOPS department. So just to set that straight from the beginning, we're in the Science, Climate and Application department. So we don't have any um, too much say in the Copernicus missions, which are, of course, um, owned by the European Commission, but operated by, and designed by ESA. We also have relatively little say in the, um, uh, in the Copernicus DSs, but we're doing all the science work in, in EOPS, so just to set that straight, okay. So I think I'd like to thank Tom and uh, Open Geohub and the um, uh, responsible people here in the um, Open Earth Monitor project for inviting me because, um, you know, I think the work that ESA is doing on projects on R&D should be coordinated to a certain extent with the work that is um, funded and supported by the European Commission. And too often, you know, the fragmentation of the European platform landscape that also Evin has um, pointed out earlier, you know, that is a lack of coordination and a lack of um, interoperability or reusing existing capabilities. And I think that's what I want to um, point out in my talk here in the next minutes. So I'm going to talk about um, EO platforms and um, open science in support of the Green Deal ambitions. Um, but let me start setting the scene here a little bit, just with a couple of general slides. You know, I mean, the background against which we are all here today and uh, the background against which we have all um, worked together in the last years is just that we have this wealth of Earth observation data coming in and uh, that's available to us now. And just looking here at the ESA um, uh, designed and operated missions here, you have the, um, the Earth Explorer, the science missions, which are, you know, the key uh, flagship science missions like uh, FLEX or um, AELOS. Um, then you have the operational Copernicus missions and the meteorology missions, right? And the numbers up there are a little bit outdated, I think, uh, but there's something like, um, what? No. There should be here, no? Okay. Okay. Exactly, up there. So you have something like 18 uh, missions in operation, 38 or something in development. You know all of that. And um, to the most important ones are, of course, to all of us, the Copernicus Sentinel missions. And um, here, this is also slightly outdated because the failure of Sentinel-1B is not uh, listed here. Also, the launch of Sentinel-6 um, has not been listed here. But, you know, we are in this situation where we're generating 25 terabytes of um, new data every, every day, disseminating more than 250 terabytes of data. And this brings us to a lot of challenges that all of you have been working on in the last years, and we have. You know, how do we actually handle this data, the data volume? How do we ensure continuity across missions? How do we share this data? How do we track a consistent archive? Um, how do we exploit synergies between missions? And, you know, how can we foster innovations with these uh, rich and, um, and uh, challenging data archives? And, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, the simple uh, term that was coined to meet these challenges was basically, you know, the paradigm of moving the algorithm to the data, um, which is, you know, not necessarily the solution to all the uh, challenges that scientists are facing with these data volumes. So in response to this, of course, the DSs were initiated. And there also we have five DSs rather than one huge one with the spinning disk archive for all of the data uh, archives. It's a little unfortunate. So I think we all came to the conclusion that it's maybe not that simple. It's not just bringing the algorithm or the user to the data. So it's a little bit more that we need. So and I think many of you have um, experienced that in your own work that, uh, you know, if you work with these um, high data volumes, that you face this issue of the data management burden. And this is just one graph. Um, there are many similar graphs around that simply say, you know, scientists work 80% of their time on managing cleaning data. That's, um, that's the data management burden. And in, in Earth observation, it's especially pronounced, I would say, you know. Researchers have to search for file lists, uh, file paths, download them, unzip them, bring them into a storage system, then run a processor over um, a file list, and then clip data and pre-processes and so forth. And then, you know, when you, you know, when you, then you also have to, um, of course, uh, explicitly um, spin up your, your processing uh, uh, VMs or whatever. And once you've done that, then you suddenly notice that your, you know, your storage is uh, full and you have to move data over here. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's basically um, preventing scientists from working on what they should actually be working, which is the scientific insights that we want to, to gain from this. So, and the, the, pro the promise that the um, Earth Observation Cloud-based platforms hold for, for science and applications is, is large. You know, there are many great things that we can get out of this. So one aspect is a simplification and democratization of uh, working with Earth observation data. And I think things like Google Earth Engine have shown that very well, you know, that uh, this is a democratization, right? A lot of the users in Google Earth Engine, they have no idea how to handle a safe file format for Sentinel-1. Um, but uh, in Google Earth Engine, it's, made, it's been uh, made very easy. Um, also, the aspects like dynamically allocating compute resources depending on your processing task and what you're currently doing, intuitive front-end syntax and stuff like that. Also, the points that uh, go towards collaborating and sharing of code, of processes, you know, um, transparency and innovation, um, concepts like um, deferred or lazy evaluation and Jupyter Notebooks. All of these are the promises that the cloud-based uh, Earth observation platforms hold, um, and these are all great aspects. Um, but if we look at the, um, at the current situation in Europe here, and uh, this is not a complete map of the platform ecosystem in Europe, it's just, um, you know, it's an incomplete map. But I think uh, someone from OGC has recently said that there's something like 78 platforms in Europe, you know, and if we saw the um, presentations from a Euro Geo earlier, I mean, there's so many great projects, but they're all, you know, developing new portals, new front ends, and new visualization interfaces, and it's, it's really an issue. So, um, also here, I just want to quote the study from Julia Wagemann that, uh, that was already brought up earlier, you know, where she looked at the current status of the adopt adoption of uh, cloud-based technologies in the Earth observation domain. And, um, well, it is uh, quite remarkable, you know, that more than 50% user, 50 of the users um, have not used any uh, cloud-based API services or a code editor in the cloud, you know. This is uh, really remarkable, and this is from 2021, I believe. So something is kind of uh, limiting this paradigm shift. And if we look at the situation compared between um, Europe and the United States, you also see that there is a difference there so you have a higher adoption of, um, of uh, cloud-based technologies and Earth observation in the U.S. Uh, compared to in Europe. So this is significant and interesting. And the question is, you know, why um, is there such a um, hesitation of adopting cloud-based EO platform services in Europe um, more widely? So and. Um, I think what, what this basically is, is this capability gap that we have in Europe, right? So um, we have this situation that we're, we have the most advanced Earth observation um, system with the Copernicus Sentinels and uh, the Earth Explorers. But the, um, you know, this um, European leadership is not necessarily matched by the, by the analytical capabilities that we're offering. And we're suffering from this, um, you know, fragmentation, redundancy, and a lack of coordination among platform providers, but also funding bodies like uh, ESA and the European Commission. Um, there's still, in many parts, a prevalence of the old VM model, you know, where you um, uh, have to spin up virtual machines instead of having dynamic resource allocation and scaling, um, which is very well solved in AWS also. And there's still, you know, um, also a prevalence of this uh, file-centric thinking and file-based storage and data, data access rather than um, pixel level perspectives um, when working with the data. Also, there's unappealing or unrealistic business models and business models in general are challenging as we had just discussed in the coffee break. And also a long-term perspective, you know, I mean, we're thinking too much in, the, in this project-centric thinking. Um, that's the funding bodies, but it's also the, the companies that are doing the work. No? Okay, and I want to just focus here in the next couple of slides um, on two initiatives that um, we have been pushing in the last couple of years and we're intending to continue to support over the next years, and that's uh, EuroDataCube and OpenEO platform. And I'm just going to quickly um, give you an overview of what EuroDataCube um, uh, contains. So it's basically a collection of integrated services here, uh, which includes Sentinel Hub, um, XCube, GeoDB, EOX Hub. 
And um, well, it provides you basically an API, um, a, a data cube API with a global data cube service. So you can uh, access the data very com uh, conveniently with different interfaces such as Xcube um, in very familiar Pythonic um, uh, uh, kind of syntax. And uh, they provide some really nice features now on algorithm pl plugin or the batch processing that's exposed through the Sentinel Hub. Um, and I'm going to show a few examples of what we did with Eurodata Cube a little bit later. But I want to focus a little bit more here on Open Your Platform, um, not only because it's a project that I believe in and it's very much up my heart, but I think also it's a very nice example. So here you have it in a nutshell. You see the, um, the consortium down there. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more in detail. So, of course, on the client side, you have these three client li libraries in uh, JavaScript, uh, Python, and R. And then you have the back end and the OpenMeo API. We'll take a little look uh, at this in the next slide. But what's really the nice thing to highlight here is that we, of course, took what was um, achieved under the Horizon 2020 project OpenMeo, and many of you were involved there. So we really um, took this when the project ended, the Horizon 2020 project, and then evaluated it under an ESA tender and uh, took it to the next level, developing an operational service based on this, on the outcome of the Horizon 2020 project. And for those of you who are not so familiar with OpenEO and OpenEO API, the situation that they um, addressed basically um, four years ago, and this is the nice graph that Edza and colleagues created here, you know, the situation was that users um, using um, Google Earth Engine or the uh, uh, GeoDPP or so, they would all have to, um, you know, learn a new programming dialect and a new syntax if they wanted to work on those specific infrastructures. And OpenEO API basically created this um, language agnostic API interface that could connect all of these different um, cloud backends um, with the um, clients and the different users. So conceptually very strong. And I think um, the outcome of the Horizon 2020 project was great. And it's a really nice um, situation that we're now under ESA funding, basically taking this to the next level, trying to establish this and evolve it into an operational service. So and we have a couple of driving concepts that we're trying to follow um, in, the, in the main project activity. And that is um, you know, abstracting complexity and uh, providing these um, intuitive analytics and uh, syntax in a federated cloud environment. So we have these um, four deployments in EODC, Terrascope, CreoDS, and now also Sentinel Hub. Um, providing transparency, of course, all of this is fully, fully open source. And, um, you know, there are uh, no concerns regarding IPR, something that's sometimes of concern. And then this big, complicated um, ambition to provide pixel level, but also continental scalability. So the users should be able to man manipulate data at the per pixel level, but at the same time have a uh, straightforward pi um, you know, um, pipeline that they can use for, for continental scale processing tasks, which is really not easy, but I think we're getting there. A cornerstone of um, OpenEO and OpenEO API and OpenEO platform are OpenEO processing graphs. And uh, you can think of these um, basically as um, instructions of, uh, of uh, processing steps and operators. And you can think of this as a, as a graphical um, uh, view here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, in the background, it is uh, basically defined as JSON syntax, um, providing all of these processing steps in a kind of a, a processing recipe fashion. And uh, this is, of course, being JSON. It's completely programming language agnostic. And this has uh, many nice features and uh, also some nice education features. So for example, this is the Open Your Platform editor view where you have a processing graph here um, in a, a, gra a, a, a graphical representation. And then you can simply automatically translate this into the different uh, uh, client languages. So JavaScript, Python, or R which is uh, nice for understanding how the API and processing graphs work together, but also for education, this is fantastic because you can, you know, you can basically allow people to learn how to um, work in these client uh, languages more efficiently. So, and this is kind of the, um, the uh, syntax simplicity that we are targeting for. And I think for all of you that have worked in uh, Python, uh, data ecosystem, this is very familiar, you know. So in this example, 
we basically connect to the um, openio.cloud um, central backend or the, the aggregator proxy. Then we define a virtual data cube, on which you are all very familiar for, with. I mean, this is similar to um, solutions in GeoDPP or the Google Earth Engine or, or other solutions. And then uh, we run the ARD surface reflectance product, uh, process here on the virtual data cube using Force and FMask uh, basically as the radiometric and cloud processor. And we can then also add some um, user-defined parameterization down here uh, for example, to turn on or off the optional BRDF or topographic normalization. Um, yes, and this is, I think for many of us, this is the kind of abstraction level that we want to have when working on these data archives, you know. Um, okay, Open Your Platform is uh, running for another one and a half years now with the uh, main um, uh, contract. And we're working along a set of use cases that are all um, resulting in new processes that uh, are available to users in the platform. Um, we also are working or beginning to work on these advanced um, federation concepts. So there is the OpenEO um, aggregator instance, which is basically an endpoint here that uh, can uh, now redistribute processing tasks to the different backends that are making up the OpenEO platform. So you have the EODC, Terrascope, CreoDS, and Sentinel Hub backend. And uh, with this uh, aggregator instance, it's quite interesting because we can basically redirect client requests to backend that host a certain data set or that host a certain processor that's maybe not available in other backends. But we can also distribute large processing uh, graphs on the different backends. So you're actually not you know, paralyzing your process only in, within one infrastructure, but you're actually executing the processing distributed in different cloud backends, which is really nice. And this is a little bit more of a detailed view here, where a processing graph coming from a, uh, from a client library, from a user, basically executes the feature engineering, the transformation of the Earth observation data into predictive features for machine learning in one data center. Uh, using the data sense uh, specific implementation of the OPO API. And the other part of the processing graph is executed in a different data set where you basically run the inference. So these are, these are I think, some really interesting advanced federation concepts that we are now exploring and, um, and making part of Open Your Platform. So here's all the resources if you would like to um, follow up on uh, more information on Open Your Platform and Open Your. Just leave that here. And just wanted to point out that, um, of course, you know, for all of the platforms in Europe, we don't have any revenue-based uh, business models. So all of these platforms need to assume some kind of business model where they request some revenue. Um, but Open Your Platform is available free of any cost for any scientific or pre-commercial activities. Um, and uh, we do that basically by uh, sponsoring uh, any licenses you require or your research group requires through the ESA network of resources, um, where you basically find a sponsoring wizard where you can request different uh, license packages and they will be sponsored. So um, we have, for example, also here quite attractive uh, new license package for research groups, so where you get uh, a license package for the whole research group. And uh, this will be sponsored by the ESA network of resources. And also we have these new features here for the uh, support packages. So you can also request some developer support if you have specific tasks where you know you're going to need some in-depth uh, developer support to implement new processes or make new data sets available. So I think these are some very um, essential elements now to, to build on top of what Open Your Platform offers at this point. For those of you who are not aware of what the ESA network of resources is, and I'm kind of um, afraid that it's probably the majority of you. So the ESA network of resources is an initiative to provide a portfolio of uh, European platform services and sponsor these services for any um, uh, scientific or pre-commercial use. Um, and it's basically the ambition is to increase the uptake of uh, usage of uh, European um, Earth Observation Cloud Services, right? So you have the links here, you can take a look at this. And uh, there is the Network of Resources Discovery Portal, and uh, there you find basically the sponsoring wizard, and it is now a simplified process where you can find, uh, you know, for example, the OpenEO uh, Open Platform IDE, uh, and you, you can request the licenses there, and it's really not a lot of work to do that. 
I think the network of resources had a little bit of a um, difficult start, but by now it's really, I think it has worked quite well. So we've supported more than 530 projects in 79 countries um, for sponsoring of European uh, cloud resources. And uh, you see here the, the stats there on the left-hand side, there are now um, 17 data processing as a service, services and 11 IDEs. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, this is an element that we're going to continue um, providing over the next years. And you see here a, a slightly incomplete list of the different providers that are, that are in the network of resources. So feel free to follow up on those links. So I wanted to take the remainder, remainder of the time here to talk a little bit about the um, Green Deal ambitions and how Earth Observation can support this here. And um, I think you know we're all well aware that this is the next cornerstone policy piece in Europe that will be really um, central to, to the Earth Observation and geospatial sectors. Um, and, you know, we had the example of the common agricultural policy in the last years and starting in 2023, you know, sentinel based monitoring of the cap is mandatory for all European countries. I mean, it's amazing that we have gotten there and all such a central role for Earth observation based monitoring embedded in, in policy. So it's fantastic. But the Green Deal, of course, is a much more a much broader and uh, far reaching um, policy framework, if you like, because it touches so many different areas, you know, not only um, clean and affordable energy, but also, you know, the trade-offs of biodiversity and food production and sustainable mobility and so forth. So it's a really complex policy piece. So the question is, you know, how can Earth Observation support the Green Deal and um, what should be the, be the role of cloud-based EO platforms and open science in supporting this? And I think, you know, the obvious, um, uh, the obvious point at hand, you know, how um, Earth observation can support the Green Deal ambitions is, of course, that we have new and upcoming observational capabilities. You know, this is just uh, an example you've seen before here with the Sentinel 5P nitrogen dioxide emissions averaged over over one month in 2018, where you know nicely at global monitoring scale you see these um, you know the the uh, cities that emit these uh, large amounts. So this is fantastic. But we're also seeing new uh, and really promising and nice approaches that use multi-scale uh, data and monitoring. So in this case, you have the Topomi Sentinel-5 measurements here on the left-hand side. Um, and then you have the GHGZ, which is this Canadian uh, private mission with um, high-resolution methane monitoring capability, where you can use, um, well, Sentinel-5 Topomi with the core 7.5 by 3.5 kilometer resolution. But then you basically zoom in with the GHGZ to do the emission attribution to see where the emissions come from. And it gets even better because now we have shown that, uh, you know, you can use the Sentinel-2 swear bands to zoom in even further and you get the temporal, also the temporal variability by um, mapping the methane emissions from Sentinel-2 with a, you know, potentially a five-day uh, temporal repeat. So I think these are really, uh, really nice examples. I, I really like these multi-scale monitoring approaches. So it's fantastic. And of course, you know, I mean, in the media, everyone's complaining about the heat wave and, um, you know, urban heat island effects um, during, uh, you know, these uh, increasingly hot summer temperatures is, is one thing uh, which was shown quite nicely here with the eco-stress sensor on the ISS. But uh, there are, you know, the upcoming LSTM Copernicus expansion mission, which will provide 30 meter, um, uh, 30 meter thermal measurements and um, also these um, uh, private company constellations coming up. So another important role towards addressing the Green Deal ambitions is, of course, advanced analytics. And there are a lot of things that we can already do on energy potential modern mapping, bringing that together with social mobility data, or the downscaling of, of Sentinel-5 Topomi to basically uh, map um, emission, emission sources and emission hotspots. ESA has, of course, defined this Space for Green Future Accelerator, where we will be working on these um, Elements such as the green transition information factories and the um, uh, the connecting this effectively with the digital twins. We also had a stakeholder workshop at the beginning of this year, and um, well, just a little bit of an insight of what the recommendations of this stakeholder workshop were. And one of them was, for example, to uh, address the energy transition, but also the kind of uh, the related trade-offs in the intertwined social economic uh, dynamics. You know, I mean, if you optimize 
uh, renewable energy production in one country, what are the impacts on biodiversity of food production? So we have to look at these trade-offs. Um, one other recommendation was to leverage and build upon existing and planned activities, um, proactively engage all uh, relevant stakeholders, and uh, you also uh, think about sustainable business growth that can emerge from this. So um, at um, ESA EOP, we now have a uh, defined uh, long-term um, open science uh, strategy, and I'm not going to go into detail uh, in this, but of course this involves, uh, you know, this comprises basically open source developments that we're making more and more, uh, incentivize more and more in our activities, um, but also, of course, all of the um, data environments that we're developing with industry. Just one example here um, of what we did with uh, Eurodata Cube was the rapid action on COVID-19 and EO. But one really nice uh, element of this was that we had this um, this um, hackathon where we basically um, asked people to come up with new ideas of how you know the economic impacts of COVID could be measured, and you know this one was not bad. I mean, they, uh, there was a team uh, that came up with this idea of using this uh, parallax effect in the Sentinel-2 image when moving objects are uh, uh, imaged. You know that you can exploit this basically to um, quantify the number of trucks, and uh, this is something that. Basically, by providing the tools to the community, they came up with this idea. And in Eurodata Cube, this has now been transitioned to an um, on-demand service that anyone can execute at continental scale. So it's a nice example of um, open science, but also uh, EO platforms supporting um, the upscaling and um, provisioning of service. Science communication is another important aspect um, for supporting the green legal ambitions. OK, let me conclude here. So, Cloud-based EO platforms can provide various abstraction levels that help scientists to cope and work efficiently with EO data archives. But the current European Earth observation platform landscapes really suffers from redundancy and fragmentation, as we have heard before. And I think what's really needed here is a little bit of a change of mindset away from project-centric thinking towards um, you know, thinking of interoperable building blocks um, to stop constantly reinventing the wheel and rather reuse existing achievements and uh, build upon those. Of course, we're going to continue working and funding projects, um, but we will incentivize very strongly to reuse existing capabilities such as OpenEO API, just one example, but also Stack or other things, you know, and um, not every project needs to reinvent data cataloging or uh, user authentication. There's just no need. It's inefficient. So key technology elements are emerging slowly from the bottom-up approach. Uh, which we heard earlier also. Stack is one example. OpenEO API is another example. Um, and advanced federation concepts can help con uh, the consolidation towards an interoperable ecosystem, which we will incentivize over the next years. Then finally, a couple of points on the role of Earth observation in the Green Deal. Um, so, you know, the upcoming and future observation capabilities together with state-of-the-art analytics will be very important. Um, powered by hopefully a federated um, platform ecosystem and open science, you know, uh, pushing for interdisciplinary data and advanced analytics, exploring these what-if scenarios, investigating trade-offs together with the emerging digital twins, and facilitating innovation co-creation and effective science communication. Um, Great, thank you. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, Patrick had some polls that we were not showing in the background, but we'll um, we'll put them up so that you guys can interact with the the presentation a little bit afterwards. Um, Should we put them up now? I mean, we have five minutes left. Maybe, we no? do, but I think you got several questions, so I don't know if you would prefer to answer questions or we can put. Can we the put polls. the poll up so that sure. oh, we have okay. it there? Okay, so we can answer the question while the poll is up, no? Yes, okay. So um, the first question was on the, you know, what's your desired level of abstraction when working on the data archives, you know, because there are those scientists that simply want a VM, but there are other scientists that want a higher level of abstraction, you know, so that's uh, that's the first question that we have for you. And um, it looks like an even split. <laughs> oh, boy. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, um, yeah, in the meantime, we can maybe address one of the questions that came up. There's lots of questions. Uh, in the meantime, Tom, maybe you could just ask a question off, off the list while the polls are active in the background over here. 
just keep on uh, keep on um, rating questions, please. What is the relation of OpenEO Cloud and OpenEO.org? Oh, that's that's exactly that. I mean, OpenEO.org is the open source community that came out of the Horizon 2020 project, developing mainly the OpenEO API, and OpenEO.cloud is the operational service that we're building with ESA funding. So, so like the backend, basically, OpenEO Cloud is the backend for well, OpenEO. Well, OpenEO.org is sort of independent of backends, whereas OpenEO.cloud federates across Creodias, Terrascope, uh, Sentinel Hub, and EODC. Okay. But it's the it's one open EO, right? It's not uh, like because open EO is open source, you could have taken it, modified, it's, make it's, your own version. It's all open source, but open EO, open EO cloud is the operational service that ESA is supporting. Okay. In development, no? uh, Maybe question. I can take the first one there on the um, open EO probably does not serve any vector data. Uh, will this change soon? <laughs> Yeah, I think indeed the uh, current um, currently working with uh, vector data in OpenEO, uh, based on what the API provides, is not yet ideal. But there is a lot of conceptual discussion now on vector data cubes uh, with EDSA, and um, this is uh, recognized that we need this, and it is um, it is in progress. And I think there are now already ways of working with. Uh, Vector data. Also, we have a GeoDB endpoint that's going to be um, becoming available as part of EuroDataCube, which is a database system for vector data, and that will be exposed through OpenEO. Uh, Valentina, do you want to put up the next poll, and then we can answer one more question after? Okay, Patrick's next uh, poll. Yeah, exactly. So this is just a question on, you know, what, how should the European platform landscape evolve in the near future, you know, because some people say like, hey, we just need a single monolithic infrastructure like AWS, you know, with the whole entire Copernicus archives on spinning disk. But, um, you know, it would be interesting to see what uh, people think if, if we should really go this way for an effectively federated system. No one's voting for the jungle, I see. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, we can leave this up for another couple minutes, and then I think we have time for one more um, user-submitted question after. The nine, nine walls, I think, so. Here, I can read it. Can you show me? Uh, here. What is your opinion on moving the Open EO as a community standard from the OGC? Okay. Yeah, I think um, OGC should consider OpenEO API as a as part of a standard, and those discussions are ongoing. So we have a, um, a Tiger team initiated that is investigating together with OGC people, um, you know, the complementarity between the OGC processes API and the OpenEO API, and the recommendations that they're making is basically for OGC to go uh, to adopt OpenEO as a, as, a, as a standard eventually, or part of a standard, so that's ongoing. Oh. Okay, um, do you wanna do the last poll and then close out? I think we have two minutes left. Yeah, sure. Great, so. There's one more question. How, uh, how much of the data in the OpenEO platform I believe all of it, all of the data that's exposed in OpenEO platform is indexed with Stack. Yeah. And of course, the data collections I didn't show, but currently it's 78 data collections that are exposed. And of course, through the federation with EuroDataCube and Sentinel Hub, we are reaching into a lot of cloud environments to making these data sets available. How much vector data do you have? Um, currently, there are no published vector data collections. So that's something I think that will happen now over the next year or so. Um, which format? Well, I mean, formats, I mean, no one has to worry about formats anymore to, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, for raster data, it's important that it's uh, available with pyramids, so cloud-optimized formats are good. But I think the user should not worry about the formats that are used in the background. If you have a DataCube API, then the data access is given, and you don't have to worry about formats anymore. Maybe solution, I mean, to market. For, for the vector data? Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure. I think that's a discussion we need to have, but certainly no longer shape files, no. I think. No, no, no. <laughs> but there are a few solutions for cloud and vector data. Yeah. So no. Everybody's talking about geopackage. But... Geopackage is nice. Okay. But let's see. Paul? Oh, yeah, this was the last poll question. So which of these aspects do you think will be the most essential to ensure a meaningful contribution of EO to the Green Deal ambitions? And I didn't talk about that, but, um, you know, this... Ah, okay, I don't want to bias the poll right now, so I'm going <laughs> to stop talking. 
<clears throat> open source and open science. Well, that's the community here. Okay. And uh, digital twins. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think this uh, feedback loop with citizens is going to be important because there are many things that we cannot observe from Earth observation where a handheld device where citizen provides some feedback on, you know, here there was an improvement of the insulation of uh, insulation efficiency of buildings or so. Those are things we cannot see. So having this feedback loop um, from citizens through handheld devices will be really important, but um, I'm biasing the poll. <laughs> Maybe they would have gotten okay. it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Patrick. I'll take the mic. Yeah.